Hi, uh, there's a couple of things I want to do before I go into a treatment with uh, Desmos about, uh, about uh, properties of exponential functions. And really, it's not just properties of exponential functions, but actually looking at their graphs and seeing geometrically what's going on, but also maybe figuring out uh, what are the general properties. A couple of things to know first. Let's say that you have a... Um, f at x equals, say, you know, 2 to the power of, uh, say, 2 to the power of x. Now, this x can be, can have a domain, believe it or not, in all real numbers. I mean, 0 works, doesn't it? Negative numbers work and so do positive numbers. So um, we have a domain here uh, where x is a number between, okay, my curly braces are deteriorating here, where x is a number such that, uh, hold on, why don't we just say x belongs to reals such that um, x is just a number between, well, not 0, but between negative infinity and infinity. So I could have just gotten away with just saying x belongs to reals, because if I don't say anything else, it's understood that if I mean all real numbers, uh, I mean all real numbers without restriction. Okay, so... The domain of this function is is here. Okay, so we have f of x equals 2 to the power x. Um, we also recognize that 2 to the power of x can be 1 half, which is 2 to the negative 1 to the power of negative x, because it's like saying that if we bring the minus sign in, it's like minus 1 times x. That's what negative x kind of signifies. So this is like saying 1 half to the negative 1 times x. That's kind of what we're saying. That means we can distribute the negative 1 inside the bracket. And so we get 1 half to the power of minus 1 and have another bracket and say to the power of x. Now what's 1 half to the power of minus 1? Well, 1 half to the power of minus 1 is 2, and we still have this positive x out here. And so, as you can see, it's shown that um, these, two, these two here are equivalent. I need a bigger pad. There we go. So these two are equivalent. A 2 to the x is indeed uh, one half to the power of negative x. So there are more than one ways of writing the same function with a different base. We demonstrated that the other day with uh, two to the power of a number, or really one half to the power of a number for things like cell division of bacteria, and comparing that against, um, you know, the natural log uh, the, the base for the natural log, which is known as E. It's rather um, rather uh, uncanny how uh, you can actually just use any base you want, really. It's just that, you know, you generally don't. You Most, most of the time, if you're doing these questions by hand, the, the human tendency is to go with the, the most obvious exponential expression and not have to do anything fancy like you know, just imagine that this would be, you know, what if we had to rewrite, hold on, what if we had to rewrite this as, as, um, say, 3 to the power of something? What would you put here? It's kind of, kind of crazy, but you could do it. You could do it if you want to, but we're, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to go in that direction. Uh, but it is possible to put some funky expression up here that does the same job as 2 to the x, but 2 to the x, you know, if you're if you're dealing with numbers like 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 
why not use base 2? These are already base 2 exponent numbers, and if the graph contains those points, might as well just go with the flow and just use the most obvious one. But my point is that it is possible that you can actually move toward a completely different, a completely different base, um, and it'll still work. But of course, you know how how do you work that out? You know that'll be that would be something that you would have to think about. But I'm not going to I'm not going to go there in this course. So the idea is we're going to be uh, graphing um, a couple of functions on Desmos, and we're going to um, just say, okay, um, some of these will be negative exponents, and we'll show you graphically that these um, uh, negative exponent expressions uh, still work even with positive exponents. So when you change the sign, uh, uh, sorry, when you take the reciprocal of the base, you have to change the sign of the exponent. That's really what's happening here. That's what's happening over here, right? Going from 2 to the x to 1 half to the negative x, all you've done, all we've done, is flip over the 2 and make the reciprocal 1 half. And then when that happens, you have to change the sign of the exponent. That's really all it is. And I showed that this proves the process going from, say, hold on, let's just get rid of this. Going from, um, going from here all the way to here. So this kind of proves the process that we can, that these two statements are in fact equivalent. Uh, let's move to Desmos now. Uh, let's go to, let's see, okay, all right. So we're going to, first of all, show you that um, we have equivalent expressions in 2 to the x. First of all, um, just in case I haven't made the point with you yet, you can actually use f of x notation for Desmos. And we're going to go 2 and then shift 6. That's a hat symbol on your keyboard and then we're going to go x and as you can see here we can actually um, we can actually see that this function 2 to the power x actually goes gradually towards 0 as x gets negative and that's because as x gets negative you're taking the reciprocal and raising the base to a power okay so if you got 2 to the power of negative 2, well, you think about 1 half to the power of positive 2. That's 1 half times 1 half. That's 1 quarter. So that's smaller than, definitely smaller than 2. And if you do 1 half to the power of 3, that's 1 eighth. So 2 to the power of negative 3 is 1 over 8, whereas 2 to the power of 3 is actually 8. But 2 to the power of negative 3 is, is 1 over 8. It's 1 eighth definitely smaller than 2 and it's also smaller than a quarter. So as x gets more negative the number gets closer and closer to the x-axis. Over here at negative 6 this is really 2 to the power of negative 6. It's 1 half to the power of positive 6. That's 1 over 64. Well that's a pretty small number and you can see it's hugging the x-axis pretty closely but it's not really not exactly zero, and it never will be zero. Um, okay, so that is that is that. But what if we wanted to change this base to something else? First of all, just ask yourself what the domain and range of this. Uh, I, before I change the base, uh, ask yourself what the domain and range of this function is. Let's just see. Well, you can see that the domain must be from negative infinity, it's simply going forever in the negative direction. It's not quite so clear that it's going forever in the positive direction as well, because it seems to be shooting up too fast for you to actually appreciate that. But if we pull this back, uh, well, it's still not clear. You can see that it looks like it might even hit an asymptote. But trust me, this is actually going, uh, this is actually going to positive infinity. Uh, in terms of x. You know, like you can have 2 to the power of a million. You can. That's a number. That's not, nothing wrong with that. But you can see the x-axis doesn't go to a million, and this y-axis is pathetically small. It only goes up to 300. 
So 2 to the power of 100 is already a, a, an amazingly huge number. Matter of fact, uh, why don't we, rather than investigate the graph, let's, let's do this. Let's go over here. Because we have function notation, how about if we just try f of 10? Because it doesn't look like we can see the number 10 here. And look, it tells us what it's equal to. Okay, f of 10 is equal to 1024. That means 2 to the power of 10, because remember, this 10 tells you what number you substitute x for. So we're substituting x for 10, and 2 to the 10 is 1024. That's why you can't see it. Our graph, remember, only went up to 300, and we'd have to really, really uh, zoom out to see um, to see what uh, what that was made of. And of course, we could also do this. We could also squish the y-axis through the graph settings. Like for example, y could be say um, say uh, five five thousand. Let's say it's five thousand. All of a sudden, the graph is flattened. But that's because the, the, the scale on the y-axis is enormously huge and it's out of proportion with the x-axis. So it does look a little strange. It looks very strange. Uh, but it still looks like an exponential function. But you don't see the y-intercept anymore. There is a y-intercept. But you can see that 2 to the power of 10 is, in fact, roughly 1,000. It's just over just over 1,000, so 1,024 as we computed over here on this uh, graph. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn the scale back again. Uh, that's fine. I'm going to make that into, uh, um, hold on, negative 10. So let's just go to the end of this. Negative 10, and the y will be 10. Um, uh, the y will be 10. Negative 10 to 10. So basically, it's a square graph. It's kind of what I like. All right, so, so f of 10, as you can see, is already 1,024. I have no idea if Desmos can do f of 100. Uh, it can, and it uses scientific notation to estimate, not, not exactly calculate, but to estimate 100. So this is a 31-digit number. <laughs> okay, a 31-digit integer. And you can see it's this 1.27 times 10 to the power of 30. Uh, it's it's a, a really, really big number. So that, you know, you're probably not going to see that in Desmos extremely well. It, it, does, it wouldn't be, a, you know, unless your scale was insane, right? Unless you had these insanely huge scales on the y-axis. But that's not my intention. So at least we can see, even though the graph doesn't show us these f of 10s and f of 100s very well, we can certainly compute them and see uh, how high it goes. So that remember, the 100 is really saying 2 to the power of 100 because the 100 tells you that x has to be substituted for that number. OK, well, what if we had this? a to the power of x. And now we're going to add a slider for a. Now we're going to, oh, something happens when we do that. Well, first of all, we're going to make a equal to 2. So a equals to 2 gives us the first graph that we came up with. Notice that uh, one of the things, apart from the fact that the horizontal asymptote is actually the x-axis, or the value y equals 0, um, it crosses the x-axis right here at x equals 1. We can zoom in and hopefully the 1 will show up. And you can see that 0, 1 is actually a point on the graph. And we can move this around. And 1, 2 is a point on the graph. 2, 4 should be a point on the graph, although it's kind of hard for it to show up just because of the maybe the resolution of the monitor maybe. Um, this should be, this actually should be negative a quarter, or sorry, positive a quarter over here at this end. There you go, negative 2, 0 0.25. So f of negative 2 is equal to 0 0.25, okay? 
and f of 2 is equal to 4, although it's kind of hard to see here. Um, so 0, 1 is definitely a y-intercept. Uh, it's a point on the graph. Let's see what happens to the y-intercept if we change the value of a. In other words, change the value of the base. So that y-intercept is saying, because it's the point 0, 1, we're saying 2 to the power of 0 equals 1. That's what that point says. So if we move a to some other number, like let's make x equal to, say, 4, Notice that curve just got steeper and steeper and steeper, but what remained the same? The invariant is that f of 0 is still 1, regardless of the base. We can make that, we can make that big, we can make that small, and it always passes through the point y equals 1, x equals 0. So the point 0, 1 is always a point on an exponential graph. It's rather interesting. So, and of course, along with that, you notice that these, that these numbers also change. Now, okay, so as long as x is greater than 1, we get this, uh, we get this increasing function. Notice that when we go below 2, it increases, just not as fast. And then when we get toward 1, 1 itself a to the power of 1 is just a. So 1 to the exponent 10, 1 to the power 10 is 1. 1 to the power of 100, 1 multiplied by itself 100 times is still 1, which is exactly right. Okay. What if we go below 1? Oh, then the curve goes the other way. And the uh, horizontal asymptote is still the x-axis, but notice as we go to positive infinity now, the function gets closer and closer to the x-axis. Now, 0 to the power of anything is 0. But notice we don't have neg negative exponents for 0 because, of course, that's outside the domain of 0 to the x. But 0 to the power of anything is 0. But 0 to the power of 0 itself is undefined. So 0, 0 is not a point on this graph. But any, any point beyond that is. So it, it does list 0, 0 as a point on the graph, but uh, it's wrong. It should not be part of the domain because 0 to the power of 0 is undefined. So let's move to the negative direction. It looks like when a is negative, we don't get any function whatsoever. So it turns out, well, what's, what's the situation here? We're, we're saying that um, uh, if a is negative, like let's say a is negative 2. Let's say, oh, hold on, i got to get a, a real pen here. So let's say a is equal to negative 2. So that means that um, we have negative 2 to the power of x. Just think of what's happening here. Negative 2 to the power of 1 is negative 2. But negative 2 squared is, see, negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4. So there's a lot of weirdness happening in this function. It's just jumping all over the place. So negative 2 to the power of 3 is going to be negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2. That's going to be negative 8. We're, we're negative again. And then negative 2 to the power of 4 is going to be positive 16. Two eights are 16. But because we have four negatives, four ne an even number of negatives will make a positive all the time. So you have basically, um, you have basically things that are al always negative. But what about like negative 1.5 to the power of, 2.3 or something. Is there such a thing? Um, turns out, I don't believe there is. And there's just too many holes in the graph, uh, too many discontinuities for you to actually see it on the graph. And that's why uh, Desmos doesn't graph it. F of 11.5, it's undefined. <laughs> so you have 
negative 2.4 raised to the power of 11.5 is undefined. Actually, that's what I expected. And it's not something that we're going to be covering a whole lot in this course. Uh, although, you know, you should be aware of these things, um, that when the base is negative, you know, the functions kind of go all funny. So let's make this equal to 0. And let's make this equal to 10. And Oh, 19? Sure, 19. Why not? And I'm going to step by the whole, oh, you know what, how about 0 0.1? And this is going to be 10, not 19. That way I might be able to get more out of this. So uh, if I do that, then I have a new slider, which only gives positive numbers. So a zero gives us what we predict. And notice that um, a positive, all positive A's, all positive values of A going from zero to positive infinity seem to give us a nice curve and it doesn't matter if it's a decimal and it doesn't matter if it's a whole number it's just we run it we seem to run into trouble when the number is negative when the base is negative now what about doing a stretch factor so if i do um b was kind of an unfortunate choice uh, or sorry a was kind of an unfortunate choice maybe i should have called this b and now I'm going to add a slider A, so A times B. And now A has a meaning. F of X equals A times B to the X. B is now our base. And notice, oh, we have some kind of strangeness going on here. I wonder what went on. Well, let's make A equal to positive 1. If A is equal to positive 1, uh, we actually get the same behavior as last time. And notice that we can... When the number goes below 1, the curve goes the other way. The, the increase, basically we get, we get a, here we get a, what we call a decreasing function. And this is another point I wanted to raise too. So we have increasing and decreasing functions. Well, let's take a look at, say, let's just set it back to 2 for a minute. Okay, so this is 1, 1 times 2 to the power x, which is just 2 to the power x, right? So, as you can see, is over what intervals does of x does this function increase? Well, it increases everywhere. And what do we mean by increasing? We mean that as x goes up, y goes up, right? As x goes towards infinity, y goes towards infinity. And what I mean is, as x goes towards positive infinity, as x increases, y also increases. And so they both increase together. And this is true all the way back to negative infinity uh, moving forward uh, toward positive infinity. So it's the function is always, always increasing. Um, so, okay. If we change b to something else, does that, does that change? That fact, as you can see here, I'm moving b all the way up to 10. That fact never changes. So we can have b, the base of the exponent, being any number we like, as long as it's a positive number. And this function will always increase. And remember when I say the function will increase, I'm implying that as x increases, y increases, right? Think about that, okay? I mean, some of you might look at this graph and go, well, I mean, it looks like if you go this way, the function looks like it's decreasing. But Mr. King is saying as you go this way, the function is increasing. Who's right? Uh, generally speaking, um, to determine who's right, uh, I mean, the way you're describing it, the way the other student would describe it, if we're going, if x is going in the negative direction, yes, the function is increasing, as you can see. But uh, and, and that is true. But the convention is x always increases. Full stop. x always increases. Then you just observe the behavior on y. Is it going up or is it going down? That's really all you care about. Okay. So you look at x increasing. If, x, if y goes up, then the function is said to increase. Okay, so, and if y goes down, the function is said to decrease. Let's say that we have um, negative a. So here, a doesn't have to be 
a doesn't you know we can make a go from negative 10 we're allowed to make a negative what happens when a is negative watch what happens so a is equal to negative 1 now and as you can see the function is what as x goes up y goes down right so as x increases y decreases so by making a negative, the coefficient in front of the ex in front of the exponent or the exponential uh, part of the expression, by making a negative, we've turned an increasing function into a decreasing function. So as you can see here, the function is definitely decreasing; it's going down. And as we uh, decrease the exponent it just goes down faster and faster. But something, other, something strange is happening. If you remember, we were saying that uh, it was practically impossible uh, to avoid y equals one as the y-intercept. But it looks like by manipulating a, like, you know, as long as we manipulate the base, the y-intercept is always at y equals one, right? It's the point zero one. But notice that this, this fact tends to change when we change a. So as a goes up, the y-intercept goes up. We can make it 3 if we want. So if a is 3, well, the y-intercept happens to be 3. Well, that's kind of strange. It means that the y-intercept is a in the, by that logic. And this is, um, this is true regardless of the base. So this is actually telling you so that 0a will be the y-intercept given that a is the coefficient in front of the b to the x. And notice b is not some, it's not some nice number, it's just an arbitrary number. If we had to um, notice that if we had to do anything to b, notice 3, the point 0, 3 becomes the invariant point, it's the point that doesn't change. Okay? Now if we make a equal to, say, negative, say negative 4, here we go. So if we make a equal to negative 4, then we change that for, um, for this one as well. And if we go below negative 1, then something happens. Oh, now what used to be a decreasing function is now a increasing function. And it's increasing all the way down to the domain. This part looks flat, but it's not. It's increasing. It's going slowly toward the x-axis. It'll never get there uh, because x-axis is the horizontal asymptote, but it's gradually getting closer and closer there. So really, the function is increasing all the way from negative infinity to positive infinity if you look at the graph. But looking at it this way, it's decreasing from negative infinity to positive infinity, meaning that as x increases, y is dropping. Uh, it's decreasing. We make the exponent positive, or sorry, we, we make the coefficient positive, and once again we have an increasing function, but if we make b less than zero, we have a decreasing function. Notice it's decreasing everywhere. As x goes up, y is decreasing. It's falling. Okay, so th these, are, these, are some, these are some things to look at. Um, so what did we say? Um, there were some uh, cases which we kind of looked at, um, which uh, helped us to analyze the graph. We're talking about a, b to the power x, and this is our f at x, right? And for the same value of x, if we just think of x as a function, and x could be just any number you plug in, if a is, let's say that a and b, well, let's say that a and b are both greater than 1. So, so if a is greater than 1 and b is greater than 1, then the function increases. You know what, rather than fight with this board and this messy handwriting, I'm just going to use an up arrow to indicate 
that f is increasing. Actually, this is going to be a greater than 0. So if, in this case, if a is less than 0, and b is still greater than 1, then f will decrease, okay? So then f will decrease. Um, let's play with some more. Once again, we're going to say that if a is greater than 0, we'll just make it some number greater than 0. It doesn't really matter, but I'll I don't want to make it 1 either. Um, then we'll study b. What if b is, well, b, b has, b doesn't, it isn't a continuous function anymore if we look at b, but if we look at um, b being, say, between 0 and 1, if a is greater than 0 and b is greater than 1, sorry, b is less than 1, sorry, not greater than 1. Okay, I better erase this. So we're saying b is less than 1, but really b is between 0 and 1. We don't mean that b is just less than 1. can't be any number less than 1. So we're saying 0 is less than b is less than 1. Then what happens to f? You can see clearly it's decreasing. So f is decreasing. Well, there are other cases, like, uh, for example, uh, we didn't consider a being negative, and notice the, the whole thing just turns upside down. All of these statements become upside down when we say that a is less than 0. So if a is less than 0 and b is still greater than 1, f decreases. And if a is less than 0, This is almost vertical writing. Um, didn't mean to do it that way, but I'm, I'm kind of at a funny angle on my desk. So then F uh, also goes the opposite way. It increases. So let's take a look at that. So B has to be a number between 0 and 1, and we're going to get an increasing function when that happens. And you can see here it is increasing, but just not in the way that it was doing um, when A was positive. So when a is negative, it's increasing, but it's increasing toward the x-axis. The x-axis is like the upper limit. It's the, the borderline by, for, over which it cannot go uh, more positive. b cannot be negative. We already established that. b, if b is 0, if b is 0, then f is 0. If a is 0, then also f is 0. But b is kind of strange in that um, x cannot be 0 itself. In fact, x can only be greater than 0. It can't be less than 0 either. So you can't have a negative exponent. So x can only be greater than 0 in that case. Okay, so those are basically the uh, sort of things that... Um, we sort of looked at with Desmos. So um, now there was a there's a question here. A radioactive sample has a half life of three days. Now we've already done a radioactivity problem uh, last day. A radio a radioactive sample has a half life of three days. Let's see if I can make a civilized um, writing of this. So this is page 183, okay? And write a function to relate the amount remaining in milligrams of time to days. So we have a half-life of three days. The initial sample is 200 milligrams. Okay, so the initial sample is 200 milligrams, meaning that your mass at time zero is 200, right? Now, what part of that exponential expression does that belong in? Well, that looks like this part, okay? So that's where your A goes. Your A becomes your 200. That's the initial sample size. So if you remember that uh, uh, M, of, M of T, where T is, T is time, 
if, if we recall m of t is equal to m of zero m m sub zero times one half to the power of the number of half lives right if you recall um, and the number of half lives was separately calculated as t divided by the half life t divided by th now of course you can as I suggested last time uh, take this expression and move the exponent and move that expression into that exponent you can do that okay that's nothing wrong with doing it uh, they can be directly substituted okay so let's go back to black ink okay all right so these are your these are your things um, this is just to remind you of what we did yesterday okay right over here um, but we have an initial sample size of 200 a radioactive sample has a half-life of three days, so we know what th is. It's three days, and it's important to know the units of time, because yesterday we had a sample, so, uh, sorry, a half-life in years, but there's nothing stopping uh, half-lives from being totally, totally different. This one has three days. Some other uh, radioactive substances have half-lives that can only be measured in microseconds like millionths of a second and then half of the substance has already disappeared so this is actually um, this is actually um, kind of important any other information we can get not a whole lot is given here we, w we want a function to relate the amount remaining in milligrams to the time in days so the amount remaining in milligrams t divided by th and we know what th is is t over 3 so this is an m of n, this is now m of t, because the only variable in this expression is t in this function. So this is really a function of t, not a function of n. So you have m of t equals 200 times 1 half to the power of t over 3. Uh, if you want to be uh, fancy, you can also say 200 multiplied by 2 to the power of negative t over 3. So that, that was part A. We wrote a function to relate uh, time to, to that. We ended up with 200 times 2 to the negative t over 3 uh, or 200 times a half to the power of t positive t over 3. Either way, it's going to be identical. So restrict the domain to the function so that the mathematical model fits the situation it is describing. Um, I'm not really sure what they mean by restrict the model. I, I think what they mean is um, probably the only restriction I can think of, and I'm not really reading the example, I just want to tell you what I think, that t, I don't think, is allowed to be negative. I think t should be greater than zero, right? Well, greater than or equal to zero, because we know the mass at t equals zero, it's 200 milligrams, right? So we know, we know the mass at time equals zero, and we can use this function to figure out the resulting mass for any time greater than zero as well, okay? Um, and so that means time, time remember is continuous. So time belongs to the set of reals. I've got this written backwards, but you get the idea. So here's the domain of the function, it's unbroken, and really we can just go from zero to positive infinity. Um, and we literally could. Um, to um, graph this function on Desmos, uh, you can do that. Um, here, we'll just take these out. Um, so this will be 200 times 1 half to the power of x over 3, right? x over 3. And, well, for some reason, we're not getting, we're not getting a function. I'm not sure why. Uh, maybe because there's an extra space here? I don't know. Oh, 200 is just too big. 
that's what it is. So we're just going to have to change the scale. So if we change the scale, um, let's see, the y-axis can have a maximum of, say, I don't know, 500. Let's say it's 500. And notice that the y-intercept is actually 200, which absolutely makes sense. Now we can actually uh, set the domain for this function. I believe uh, x greater than or equal to 0. I think you can do that. And now we have a valid graph which goes in the positive direction. Notice that you can actually use Desmos to state the domain. Not just write a function in function notation, but actually state your own domain that fits the situation. So that's one of the nice things about Desmos. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, as I'm developing this idea for your, um, for your assignment at the end uh, of this chapter, um, I would like you to use Desmos uh, for your graph and notice that there's opportunities here to do a very precise graph in Desmos. This is an amazing graphing tool uh, and you should take advantage of it. It's free. You just log in as yourself using your Peel managed email account and uh, submit, share your link with me uh, in the submission window uh, when I assign, when I give the assignment. Uh, rather than having to upload things. Well, actually, you might still have to upload things because you might have to work things out on paper as part of the assignment as well. But as you can see here, you can do some pretty good graphs. Uh, and notice the notation here. Um, you know, if this was a textbook, I think this is missing a comma. I don't know what effect a comma would have, but you're supposed to put a comma there. And you can see that kind of destroys the graph. That's not what Desmos expects. So it looks like it's almost like you're it's almost like you're just putting the domain of the function right up against the function itself. Not sure why they decided to do that, but that's what they did. And by the way, if you were using, say, a uh, graphing calculator like a uh, TI-84, the TI-84 does this too. Uh, you can actually state the domain, but you have to state the domain right after the function. No commas. It's pretty much like what you see here. So, you know, if you were using, mind you, you cannot submit what you have on a graphing calculator to me, but you can definitely submit something like this. And of course, at the end of the day, this function is either right or wrong. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you might want to play with things a bit. Uh, but as you can see, this, this, um, this example is not a bad example. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about exercises, uh, starting on page 185 to 187. I always include a question from Part C, as you know, because those are where your thinking questions are going to come from. And the more of those you do, obviously that's better on you uh, in terms of being able to tackle the math and of course, if you have a question, as always, email me. Um, you know, I'm not going to bite, don't worry. So now, page 185, numbers, really the A section looks good. A uh, lot of graph sketching. If you want, you can do this in Desmos. So one through, really one through six. And... Since you're doing this all in Desmos, I don't mind giving you all of them, 1 through 10. And then what do we do after that? Um, number 11 is asking you to read a graph. So 11. And then let's go into C. Uh, C says use technology, but notice that they're asking you, it looks to me like they're getting you to use a, T, a Texas Instruments TI-84 calculator. Of course, it's it's kind of dicey whether you have that at home or not, and I don't expect anyone to have a TI-84 at home. Maybe some of you do. I, you know, maybe some of you are doing, um, you know, uh, something that requires it for one of your other courses. I'm not sure what or how or why, but, you know. Um, there's nothing wrong, though, with doing this in Desmos, and, of course, the window settings 
for a TI-84 is analogous to the window settings here. You just set the X and the Y axis to whatever you think will contain the important bits of your function. Um, okay, uh, that's number 13 in part C, but you know what? Um, maybe we'll skip over to number 14. We have a square base pyramid in number 14. And then I'll stop at number 14. So numbers 1 through 11 and number 14. There you go. That's pretty much your homework uh, for today. And uh, I will see you tomorrow. And tomorrow will be transformations of exponential functions. Sounds like fun.